a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. Let us turn to the very strengths in technology that spawned our great industrial base and that have given us the quality of life we enjoy today. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished by Victor Technologies, the high-flying hardware computer company which took a nosedive this year, may be bought out by the British firm Applied Computer Technologies. Piloting the space shuttle is very difficult to do, one would think. Can a, a, a kid or a normal person actually pull this off? Well, what I did when I designed this was I, I understood that problem. Uh, it seems the sweep of technology has no limits. In San Francisco this week, the world's first robot bartender was unveiled. The robot can talk, can take spoken orders, and can mix 200 different drinks. But on the first test run, the robot knocked a glass off the bar and onto the floor and poured beer all over the counter. The robot's designer said there were still some bugs to be worked out. the Cebu store is proud of its technology and is worried that customers will feel it has lost the human. 
Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. Let us turn to the very strengths in technology that spawned our great industrial base and that have given us the quality of life we enjoy today. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished by Victor Technologies, the high-flying hardware computer company, which took a nosedive this year, may be... And we're live, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. To answer the question, Georgie uh, is traveling right now, so he's not going to unfortunately be here today. But thank you guys so much for joining me. We're going to get through all your questions that were posted on YouTube.com uh, on, the, on the community tab. Uh, so just to get into it, uh, please give this episode a like. That really helps the show. And, and some super huge news. The show is now on Anchor Podcasts. And so... That's something that's been requested for a long time, and I don't know why, but uh, it never seemed like super important to me to get that on there because I thought the the live stream was its own thing, and I didn't want to confuse the live streams for podcasts. Don't ask me why this is my strange <laughs> strange thinking, uh, but uh, obviously that is something that people really wanted, and so I downloaded every single episode put it through uh, like a normalizer, which is uh, another thing we've had some issues with on the live stream. And so uh, hopefully you guys like that. It's on Anchor Podcast right here. As you can see, it's anchor.com or anchor.fm slash Danny Roddy. And also now on Spotify. So I think uh, people will appreciate that. And you guys uh, can check that out. Um, Okay, uh, other, some other news, uh, Anchor Podcast, it's, uh, yeah, okay. Um, try not to watch the chat or it will confuse me. Uh, I had a great conversation with the Strong Sisters last night, so I'm, uh, I'm a little sleep deprived, <laughs> but I'm going to try to get through all your questions. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for joining me. They are defunct uh, or defected carnivores, and so... Talking to them again is just, is really fascinating to me because I I have a special interest in like the, the history of carnivore dieting uh, via the bear Stanley Osley or Osley Stanley rather uh, Charles Washington and who now Sean Baker is is the mascot for so that type of meat and water approach I know they were more of a uh, mixed type of diet carnivore but. We talked and, and they're dipping their toes into kind of the bioenergetic point of view. And, uh, and it was a really great chat. And I think we're going to do more of them. So that should be very fun. I do uh, uh, coaching on patreon.com slash Danny Roddy. You can check that out. And is there any other big news? I think that's it. And so we have like a pretty tentative schedule. Uh, I think. Hopefully next week, Georgie will be joining me. Uh, and then after that, I think if he doesn't join me next week, he'll join me the week after, hopefully, fingers crossed. And then Ray will definitely be on on the, I think, my 28th. I don't have a calendar in front of me, but it, he'll be on towards the end of the month for sure. Let me just read these really quickly. Cardo Chav, are you still in Thailand? Yes, I am. Uh, it's a super long story, but uh, originally the amnesty for foreigners was supposed to go till. Uh, uh, August 1st and you were supposed to be out of here and then they extended it till till September 28th and so it's actually kind of scary because there's any flight that I book to leave in September gets automatically canceled and so I like Thailand I like being with my girlfriend but I'm also really t uh, terrified <laughs> of like what's happening right now and so I know that there's not really a way I think out of that this situation that's happening but i, I to be honest i think i'd be f feel more comfortable in mexico and i'm sure i've said this before but mexican people you don't have to convince them that the police are corrupt or the government is corrupt they just inherently know that already and so uh, i just i want to be as far away from Amer america as possible i know mexico is not very far but i don't i'd rather be in mexico than um america for the next 
few years. And I don't, and the, one of the criticisms of the Ray podcasts uh, is that they're a downer. And <laughs> I think this is just kind of reporting reality, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, and Ray, who is one of the most optimistic people I think I've ever talked to before, uh, Patrick Timponi, uh, he had, uh, one of the questions was, what advice would you give a young person uh, like that was 30 years old? And Ray said something like, prepare because things are going to get a lot worse. <laughs> and so, again, I think, um, I think we're in an interesting situation. I, uh, you know, hope for the best, but I guess prepare for the worst. And part of my preparation, I think, is just not being in the U.S. And so I'm, I'm fortunate that I already took measures to be able to stay in Mexico. OK, anything else here? Uh, follow me on t uh, Twitter and Telegram. I try to keep those things uh, updated. There's lots of like content I post on there that people not um, definitely don't see otherwise, you know. Um, I think that's like the, the platform I immediately go to. And uh, is there anything else? Telegram is, is kind of a mimic of my Twitter. And I think that's it. OK, let's get into your questions. OK, so the first one is, could you talk about how to protect yourself from EMF exposure, how toxic you think it is for human health and in maybe a comparison to the other harmful surrounding uh, surroundings in which way protecting yourself uh, you would recommend? Uh, so this is a good question. I don't honestly know the answer. Like, I don't know how harmful EMF is compared to uh, like a toxic fat reservoir of polyunsaturated fat on your body. Like that's probably worse. And I think the EMF is contributing to that. Um, like uh, David of Zenso Health was talking about Ray and, and talking, it, seeing if you could look at like health as um, the person uh, saying in that reduced gain of electron state or that oxidized loss of electron state. And I think EMF is one of those things like in a sense, like contributing electrons and and those electrons uh, participating in harmful oxidation reactions such as lipid peroxidation. And so uh, from Nicholas, I don't know how to say his last name. Um, I just cut this out real fast. Um, oh, uh, Nick Pen Penolt. <laughs> I'm sure I'm bringing that up. But anyways, I've, I've referenced this book multiple times and I really should talk to Nick. Uh, but it's the non tinfoil uh, guide to EMFs. And the thing that specifically caught my eye is he, this was a quote from somebody. He said, uh, what EMFs do in the body is that they work on some channels in the plasma membranes of our cells uh, called voltage gated calcium channels. Uh, what they do is that they open up those channels, calcium flows into the cell, and it's the excess calcium in the cell that leads to all the biological effects that are produced by EMFs. So that's important because that's like a main theme of a lot of the things that Ray is talking about. This is another paper I've, I've talked about many times, uh, but it's by Fajita. Hopefully you guys can see this. Oh, yeah, you can. And he says uh, it's uh, less well known is the calcium overflow from bone that occurs to prevent decrease of blood calcium and the calcium deficiency caused by parathyroid hormone with consequent calcium overflow in the soft tissues and intracellular compartment. And so the, the accumulation of intracellular calcium, as I understand it, uh, is uh, mediated by things like parathyroid hor hormone and decreasing the carbon dioxide. And so this is why I think calcium is so, eating calcium is so central to Ray's approach because that lowers uh, parathyroid hormone and helps to um, defend against the intracellular calcium. Uh, oh, this is actually not the paper I'm looking, even looking for. It's another fajita. Oh, it's another fajita paper. Okay. And, uh, but fajita says that when the intracellular calcium happens, he says all cell death is characterized by an increase in intracellular calcium. Uh, increase of cytoplasmic uh, calcium, uh, free calcium may therefore be called the final common path of cell disease and cell death. And then another thing that uh, happens with the intracellular calcium is uh, the nitric oxide, I think, turns on. Let's just explore that. Um, the entry of calcium through these channels into cells stimulates nitric oxide synthase activity uh, binding to calm. You do, do uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but this is something else you could explore. But the, again, I understand very little, but I think this is uh, what's what's occurring. 
And then I, I asked Ray in 2017 uh, what the, the progression of everything looked like. And he said, this is very helpful, I think. He said, estrogen, hyperventilation, lactate, et cetera, increases serotonin. And I think it's serotonin that directly increases parathyroid hormone. hormone and then parathyroid, hor- uh, parathyroid hormone increases nitric oxide. So that's kind of the uh, cliff notes to that whole subject. Um, Okay, I just want to make sure my volume and everything is good. Looks good. Okay. So let's get to more of these questions. So, so I didn't really answer the question at all. And so I don't know how to defend against uh, EMF stuff other than building yourself like a, a small little tent with some kind of fabric. And so I probably told this story, but in Mexico, I uh, put up an like, aluminum screen. It was a total pain in the ass. It was kind of expensive. I basically ruined the walls of the, the place I was in, which was not a great uh, idea, especially when I was moving out. And uh, but I did have some natural uh, anti EMF fabric that worked really well, but it was really expensive. And so if I had to do it over again, I think I would have tried to create some kind of like bed situation tent and then ground the fabric to the wall. Uh, and so I'm, I'm shocked given the advent of 5G that this like these tents and stuff aren't more uh they're not more readily available it's it's like shocking that there is no consumer product based on this stuff and that you have to really search hard and and like uh some of the products you just don't know what you're getting when you're when you're looking at the advertisement so it's a little bit shocking to me but i mean i guess hopefully the market picks up for these types of things okay good question uh i i probably didn't fully answer it but I, again i think increasing your uh thyroid sub, subsequent carbon dioxide production decreasing the polyunsaturated fats i think that limits the harm of the emf but again i think we're, we're trying to be these oxidized vessels in this reducing world and the emf is one of those things that is uh causing the chronic harm uh switching to or promoting that pseudo pseudo hypoxia blocking the pyruvate dehydrogenase and creating i think proportionally more lactic acid over a lifetime and so i think that's just one of the contributors and i'm in a a building right now with just a insane amount of uh wi-fi and i'm sure cell phones too so uh yeah can't wait to go back to mexico uh okay uh this person says or make sure you guys can see this Oh, uh, Carter Chef says, do you think the RF blocking wall paint works from I there are some good videos on YouTube that they I mean, it definitely seems to work. If I owned a house, I would be all over that stuff. You know, unfortunately, I'm just too poor. <laughs> but if I owned a house, I would immediately think about uh, blocking it uh, with with a paint uh, substance. OK, question. Uh, why obese people have good hair and hairline while they eat anything they want, though they have high estrogen? How can we stop overactive adrenal glands diet? So I feel like a question like this comes up every single time we do these live streams. But this is like a lot of assumptions about somebody. And so, again, I just don't think you can really judge somebody's physiology just by looking at them, uh, per se. And I think an empirical approach is warranted. And for that, you'd have to take their pulse, their temperature get lab tests like uh, total cholesterol parathyroid hormone prolactin a fat person isn't necessarily uh not responding to stress more favorably than a really lean person and so again this is i I don't know it's called like lookism like it's kind of part of our culture but just because somebody's uh heavier does not mean they're in a worse state of health than a lean person and so i uh that's something I've learned over my time in the health sphere. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is there any more? Oh, uh, and, I, and I think I go over this a little bit in the solving the hyper adrenalism of, of pattern boldness. And so that talks about how younger guys with pattern boldness had activated adrenals and they were pouring out DHEA. And while I think DHEA is a pr- protective hormone, usually it rises with cortisol. And so... Again, I think they were in intense uh, stress state. And then the DHEA, I think, is being converted into estrogen. Okay. Um, how can we stop overactive adrenal glands with uh, diet? Again, I think getting the thyroid function up, uh, getting a good, satisfying, complete diet, solving bowel problems, I think, th- I think those are great starting places for approaching that. And then, again, l- lab work if uh, the quality of life is, is really uh, subpar. 
Okay, hey Danny, why does milk cause acne anyway to fix this? And so uh, I think uh, like a, the, probably the common way to address this a lot of the times is uh, including foods like uh, liver and oysters. And so I think the liver contains vitamin A and then the oysters contain zinc. And a lot of times a person will be deficient in those uh, specific things. And so I think the milk, uh, the, the calcium is having a uh, pro-metabolic effect. And just to say, uh, I think if we type in milk and cholesterol, this is something I wanted to bring up with Ray, but just haven't had a chance to yet. But this says, uh, in 1977, this says, uh, the results suggest that milk contains a hypocholesterolemic uh, factor a hypothesis, which is supported by greater hypocholesterolemic effect of skimmed milk. And so again, I think that's similar to thyroid lowering the cholesterol and uh, increasing the turnover into pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA. And so when Ray says uh, for a low metabolic person to drink milk, I think this is what he's getting at. That milk, in a sense, is similar to thyroid in that it will increase the metabolic rate. And um, is this the one? And then milk contains some estrogen, but it also contains testosterone, progesterone, and it actually contains thyroid too, according to this. So they say testosterone, have been found, uh, testosterone has been found in low concentrations in bovine milk. The concentration of free estrogen is higher in whole milk than in skim milk. Progesterone has been measured in the milk of a number of species that exist in various concentrations. Um, it is clear that T4, T3, and reverse T3 are present in human milk. T, uh, T4 and T3 are also found in the milk of various a laboratory domestic animals. So, uh, so, so again, people poo poo milk, but I think uh, it can be some uh, good stuff. Okay. And then, if uh, if the liver and oysters and uh, did not fix anything, uh, and there was diarrhea or constipation or gas, I would suspect that might be a, a possible um, aggravating factor. Okay. Good stuff. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Sincerely appreciate it. Uh, give this episode a like. Uh, if you're annoyed by me saying that, this is the life that I've chosen. So give this episode a like. Uh, subscribe to this channel. That means a lot to me, so I appreciate it. Uh, okay, this one. Any thoughts on resolving histamine intolerance? I find it quite uh, hard to eat PD foods. Since my body starts itching a lot, uh, for instance, eat mostly fruits or fruit juices. I also have a hard time tolerating milk. How would you go about fixing these issues? So for what it's worth, when I got off of zero carb uh, and I started in introducing uh, starches into my diet, I felt like I couldn't digest anything. And I, I think that reflected how low my metabolic rate was at that time. And so I, I also think I had some kind of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So again, if in, in addition to the histamine intolerance, uh, and I'm not even totally sure at this point what that specifically means, <laughs> uh, but uh, in addition to that, if there were constipation, diarrhea, or chronic gas, trying the carrot salad, trying the mushrooms, uh, maybe trying that fluorosis product, the bacteriophages, and if the, none of those worked, maybe exploring uh, kind of the safer antibiotics like penicillin, VK, erythromycin, or the tetracyclines, I think that would be uh, useful, again, because these things really interfere with the quality of life, and so I think it's, and they can be, like, severe food intolerances can sometimes, again, be traced back to, uh, I think, a, be a bacteria in the intestine and a, like getting rid of that can make the life a lot better quickly. So uh, in my understanding, estrogen and histamine has a close interaction. I think uh, estrogen is one of the things that causes the degranulation of mast cells releasing histamine. And I think that's just part of the whole stress system. There's a, another question about histamine here. I don't fully understand where histamine fits into the whole uh, stress system. And so that'd be actually be a question I'd like to ask Ray at some point. Good stuff. Uh, this one, uh, what ratios would be best for increasing metabolism when supplementing vitamin K2 along with vitamin D? I know there's a huge, not I don't know how huge they are, but a faction of people anti-vitamin D. Uh, I'm pro-vitamin D, <laughs> I, but I think I'm, it's not shocking to me that people could react to taking the supplements orally. 
And so I, for what it's worth, I use it on my skin uh, and I try to eat as few supplements as possible. And so I think and the, I, that faction is talking about how magnesium is, uh, is like a vitamin D deficiency is actually magnesium, but nobody's really advocating a ma- promoting a magnesium deficiency. <laughs> and so I think good thyroid function and having a source of magnesium is important. And uh, it definitely wouldn't be shocking to me if somebody was taking vitamin D and similar to milk and thyroid that was increase, increasing their nutritional requirements. And maybe they develop some other type of deficiency be, because of that. So anyways, I think the, te- the vitamin D is easiest because you can get that test. And uh, the vitamin K is uh, a little bit more ambiguous. Like apparently it's extremely non-toxic. And so I think this is why it's used in really high amounts. And like people always talk about those J- uh, Japanese trials for osteoporosis where they use 90 milligrams. Uh, and so, I, again, I think this can be used in a, a big amounts. And apparently, the vitamin K has a relationship with uh, PUFA. And so, maybe the big doses are especially useful when a person is saturated with uh, polyunsaturated fats. So, it said, uh, this is... O- Okayama in 2016, they say these vegetable oils and medicines such as a statin warfarin share in part a common mechanism to inhibit, inhibit vitamin K2 dependent processes, which was interpreted to lead to increase blah, blah. Um, so again, they have a relationship and maybe the more saturated a person is with the vegetable and seed oils, maybe the more vitamin K they could get away with. Okay, uh, what are your thoughts on displacing PUFAs and particular linoleic acid quicker than the four years Ray has mentioned it would take by supplementing around 20 to 25 grams of steric acid uh, daily? This is something that Brad Marshall is experimenting, experimenting with on his croissant diet. So I don't know about this. I know Georgie has uh, talked about this maybe on uh, his hateit.me. I don't have an opinion on this. For what it's worth, when, it, when Ray was talking about de- decreasing the polyunsaturated fat intake, that meant to me over like the long term of a person's life, you know? And so that, that's how I've always approached it and not thinking that it was something to um, try, like PUFA restriction was this like p- panacea to, to reduce as low as possible, as quickly as possible. It was like try, trying to construct ways uh, nutritionally that would limit the polyunsaturated fat in a natural way that I could do for a very long time, you know, because if somebody goes on just some crash extreme diet or something like that, it's, it's probably not going to be maintainable over a long period of time. But the, the steric acid, I'm just not, I'm not sure I haven't read about it. Good stuff. Uh, Brayden uh, said, let me make sure everything's okay. Uh, okay. Good stuff. Thanks guys. Uh, coming from low carb, high fat diet, is fructose harder for the body to become reacquainted with than glucose? And irregardless, how can I improve fructose utilization if there are any? If anything, it's probably easier because I think the free fatty acids that are mobilized in stress block um, a part of glycolysis that fructose can bypass. I think it's the PFK 1 <laughs> um, if you're looking at the, the long glycolysis, uh, all the different steps. So, uh, so I, I don't think it is, but maybe the, it, the vehicle is, is the problem. So again, it's very difficult to find good sources of fruit. Uh, it's very difficult to find good sources of fruit juice. And, and so, yeah, it's a big project to, to find these things. And so that's what makes a lot of this stuff difficult is the food supply is so terrible. Um, but, uh, body work home. Yeah, so, so again, I, I don't think that's necessarily accurate, and I don't think, I don't, I, I don't know of anything to improve the fructose utilization, except trying to increase the metabolic rate, uh, as indicated by the pulse and temperature, obtaining full nutrition, and then again, always focusing on the intestine, and if there's constipation, diarrhea, or gas, those things are major indicators, in my opinion, that something is, is wrong. And the intestine, the endotoxin, uh, is like diabetogenic, and so that I think uh, promotes uh, uh, the free fatty acids, like a powerful activator. Uh, okay, thanks for that last one. Um, 
How do you approach what counts as everyday food to most? Are there rare times where you'll have street taco or curry despite their propensity to be cooked in pufa laden oils? What do you pack for long traveling days or days we'll be spending a lot of time outside of the house? So I, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, tell anybody else to do this, uh, but I, t I, t I can't remember the last time I've like eaten out. No, okay, that's a lie. I, with my girlfriend, we went to Kolon, and I basically, because of the the getting to the hotel and spending time there, uh, we. I didn't really eat that much that whole day. And then we went to kind of a nicer restaurant there. And I got uh, some Tom Yum. I can't believe Tom Yum Goon. I, am, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. Um, Tom Yum, which is really ridiculously good. And I saw like a thin layer of oil on it and I just ate it anyways. But that's very out of character for me. And so I'm, I'm typically not... It's not really something that is attractive to me to eat street food, you know, and things like that. And that that was like a restaurant, so it wasn't technically street food. But in Mexico or even Thailand, I uh, that is very out of the norm for me. And I, I really I think I've only eaten out here twice and I've been here for almost a year. So that time in Kalan and then one other time at like a steak restaurant. And so that gives you an idea of how often I eat out and it's just incredibly rare. So again, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just trying to mitigate harm in all the ways I know possible. And I think if you're eating out, you're just taking in a huge amount of those polyunsaturated fats. And uh, I'm just trying to be risk adverse in the long run. You know, I've had very serious health problems in my early twenties that came and went, you know, and I'm not. I'm not trying to roll the dice <laughs> to see how uh, close to the edge I can live. I, I, it just makes sense for me to, to minimize them. And also, it's easy. It's not a difficult thing. It's not something I'm like uh, pulling my hair out trying not to, not to eat. Um, okay. Okay. I'll answer Super Chats at the end. Thank you guys so much, guys. Uh, and thanks for hanging out with me. Sincerely appreciate it. These are great questions. Oh, uh, what do you pack for long traveling days or days you'll be spending a lot of time outside? This I, I can work around. So usually I'll have like a plastic milk bottle or something and I'll put milk in it and I'll carry it if I know I'm going to be out for a long time. Uh, like if we're going to some day trip or something, I'll, I'll carry that milk there. But uh, yeah, I don't do that that often. But it's, so I'm get, gearing up at some point to go on some insane plane trip from here to Korea to Vancouver to Mexico. And I'm just like considering those days probably a wash. Like I, I, I might be able to find good food somewhere in one of those airports. But uh, like I, I, I don't purposely try to do it, but, but like I'll probably be fasting for a lot of that time just because I don't want to upset my stomach on a plane ride because that would be like torture. And so but I remember landing in a Kore the Korean airport and they had like fresh orange juice there. So you do get lucky sometimes. But and also I have a glass thing. I don't necessarily take it with me, but that could be used uh, as well to take food. OK, uh, Danny, do you think that the hormone profile of the saturated fat of the milk of grain fed cows is something to be concerned with about or does? Or does the complex digestive system of the cow factor out the potential problems? Looks like Hans just posted an article dedicated dedicated to this question. Spectacular. Yeah, I saw that. Um, uh, I don't. If I had a link to that article, I would go to it. But uh, yeah, Hans Adamo. That was a good. I perused through it, but that was a. You know what? I might actually have it. <laughs> I think I saved it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, let me. Oh. Okay, well, this is the article. I got 99 problems, but the estrogen in milk ain't one. And so, yeah, check this out. Uh, I, I'd have to read through it more closely, but I think in general, he does pretty good work. So, um, no. There we go. Okay. Okay, uh, and, and to be honest, I don't have a strong opinion on this question. Do you think that the hormone profile of the saturated fat of the milk of grain-fed cows is something to be concerned about? I, I honestly have no idea. 
So, yeah, I'd have to give Hans his uh, post a skim. Hello, what turned uh, terminal hair follicles to vellus hair follicles? What causes... Uh, so, there's that paper that they call... I think it's the estrogen terminal to vellus switch. They say the transformation of terminal to vellus... Um, oh, I think I was... You guys... Could you guys see my Evernote? I might have not minimized it. Shoot. Okay, whatever. Next thing. Sorry, I have like a new setup and switching between the browser window and my Evernote is there's one step I always have to do. And so sometimes I'm forgetting to do it. Anyways, okay. Uh, so this paper, uh, 2006, they say the transformation of terminal to vellus hair follicles is androgenic alopecia, so called, is also associated with discrete infiltration of parafollicular macrophages uh, phages with the mast cell activation, which has been proposed to be the inherent to terminal a vellus switch itself. And so this goes back to um, hair loss uh, uh, mass cell starts with an L. Let's try to find it real fast. And guys, I'm using Evernote. I don't know uh, what you guys use to collect notes, but I, I do know that this was an important part, uh, I think, of detaching from different forms and things like that. And so I think I started this in like 2010 and I just started adding information that I thought was relevant to it. And I really feel like it's been a just gigantic mega resource. And so I, it's hard to think of what I would do without it. So anyways, they, they talked about mast cells being the inherent terminal to vela switch. And then in uh, 1975, they said the role of mast cells in pattern boldness is unknown, but the large numbers uh, of, of Often present is a striking feature. And then another paper, they talk about the mast cell de degranulation was a prominent feature in sheaves of affected hair follicles that was associated uh, activation of fibroblasts resulting in uh, fibrosis. And then a 2012 paper talking about uh, field vulnerable. So this Larson paper in 2014, they say, um, Oh, they say these data indicate that the scalp is spatially programmed via mast cell prostaglandin D synthase distribution in a manner reminiscent of the pattern seen in androgenic alopecia. And so I made a video about this a long time ago, but the, the shape of pattern, the whole head is being affected. That's important. The sides, the back, uh, but the, the shape apparently is because of the accumulation and activation of mast cells, which are affected by tons of different things, specifically estrogen, temperature. Um, and then the accumulation of polyunsaturated fats like changes the role of the mast cells as well. And so, uh, again, I think, uh, and all this stuff, Ray has not this specific part of the pattern boldness, although I think he's mentioned it, but all this stuff fits into Ray's model, I think, very, very well. Okay, let me get this back up. Okay. What causes greasy scalp? Uh, usually, I think hyperlactin, it causes the excess sebum secretion. Moreover, I've read your book almost article and I follow your instructions to some extent, but not perfectly. Subsequently, I experienced an increased mass of body hair on my arms, uh, backs, back, legs, palms, but most importantly, new vellus hairs on my temples and frontal scalp. Oh, what your point about that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think that the body hair can be kind of a sign that uh, uh, that might not be so great, but if you're uh, regrowing scalp hair. Can I consider new and increased mass villus hair body hair as a sign of regrowth? Follow just 50% of your restrictions. I don't know. That's, it's hard to say without knowing more about you and uh, how you're feeling, your pulse and temperature and things like that. Because I, I do think that like the increased body hair density in aging might not be uh, that great of a sign. Um, and that goes with like the the androgenization and estrogenization of the person as they get older. Uh, but good stuff. Yeah, I don't have too much to say about that specifically. Okay, do you follow Jack Cruz's protocol when it comes to watching the sunrise as first priority of the day? If so, not why not? Absolutely not. <laughs> I've never done that. Not specifically any... I didn't even know that he thought that. Uh, so Jack Cruz has a very, like... Uh, comical history online. And so maybe if, uh, if a person 
was new to him. Like he has kind of like an interesting background on paleo hacks and so like unfortunately like I think his older actions inhibited me from learning anything from him and so that's not to say anything about his idea it doesn't invalidate his ideas. Unfortunately I just cannot learn from him. <laughs> so he might uh he might have uh some good ideas but I can't take anybody that quotes themselves seriously. So unfortunately uh yeah but I'd be interested, like, the, I, watching the sunrise, that doesn't sound like uh, a bad idea to start the day. Would be really curious on Ray's opinion of Agenis Vonderplanets and his take on raw animal foods, steak tartare. Uh, I don't know that. I, I mean, I'm very aware of Agenis, but I've never read any of his work. And so I don't even, I don't know, like, the specific reasons he recommends those things. And I know this person was asking about Ray, but they, they clarified. <laughs> Um, I don't think I don't know if Ray has ever mentioned that, but Josh Rubin in an older interview did ask Ray about raw foods and the idea that they contained enzymes. And I think Ray's answer was something like the the basic idea was uh, faulty. I think, for what it's worth, Joseph Swar uh, says, "Is T3 supplement alone without T4 uh, supplementation bad, and why?" N no, I think it's totally. Uh, fine to take T3, you know, for what it's worth. There's a paper by Morton in 1957. Oh, let me, I don't think you guys can see this. Paper by Morton in 1957. And they specifically talk about this being effective for sometimes for people that didn't respond to like desiccated uh, thyroid. Uh, but in my own personal experience, you know, I take it with a grain of salt, but I could not like get, get control of a lot of symptoms only taking T3. And so sometimes I get to a point where I felt really good during the day taking only T3 and then I go to sleep and become like super hypothyroid during the nighttime, wake up super hypothyroid and then take T3 and f start feeling better towards like the mid afternoon and then go to sleep again, get, become hypothyroid. And it was just like a big roller coaster. And so at least for myself, I do a lot better with, with a T4 and I think uh, the middle road is increasing the ratio of the T3 to T4. So instead of a 1 to 4, maybe a 1 to 3 or even a 1 to 2. So I think that makes, not that taking thyroid is risky in my opinion, but I think that makes the whole uh, situation even easier. Uh, but I think T4, taking T4 without T3 is uh, pretty risky. Okay. Uh, it's been shown that sugar can overwhelm glycolysis and deplete the NAD pool, raising NADH and essentially causing stress to the body, making it oxidized back to NAD. Uh, how to reconcile the idea that sugar simple carbs are superior energy? But you're, you're just describing the, the process of making lactic acid, and, and I don't think anybody wants that. And I, and I think the missing piece of the puzzle is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and that's the link reaction linking glycolysis to mitochondrial respiration. And so. Yeah, nobody's advocating uh, lactic acid uh, production. That that activates the pituitary and is like the kickoff of the stress reaction. I think. Um, so yeah, to, the pyruvate dehydrogenase I think is the major missing piece of that puzzle. And there's um, oh, let me minimize this. The that new hat Randall this is a very good paper. About this whole thing uh, by Q in 2009. I have some like added extra notes in here, but um, I think this is what I'm looking for. As pre digested fatty acid ketone bodies are preferentially oxidized uh, extra hepatic tissues by inhibiting glucose oxidation, fatty acids and ketone bodies are contribute to the glucose sparing effect and essential survival mechanism for brain during starvation and addition. Inhibition of glucose oxidation at the level of pyruvate dehydrogenase preserves pyruvate and lactate. Both of which are gluconeogenic precursors, and lactate, uh, I think, participates in increasing gluconeogenesis. Both not good things. And um, what else was I going to add to this? Oh, uh, 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 Jeff Volek. <laughs> this was interesting, too. Um, so some people try to like deny that this stuff is happening, but like Jeff Volek is somebody that's, like, to my knowledge, really respected. And he has this paper, Nutritional Ketosis, Mitohormesis, Potential Implications for 
mitochondrial function function in human health and um he says like explicitly that he thought the pyruvate dehydrogen dehydrogenase was inhibited in addition to decrease in glucose availability during nutritional ketosis glycolysis may be further inhibited through the activation of pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase and subsequent in inhibition of py pyruvate dehydrogenase which occurs in response to dietary carbohydrate restriction or infusion of beta hydroxybutyrate acetoacetate or fatty acid <laughs> and then of course the I'm not an expert in this, but the ketone body ratio. So the higher the beta hydroxy butyrate goes, that goes with the NADH, and the lower the acetoacetate goes, that goes with the NAD. And so, again, you're just you're the keto is like pushing the person in this reduced state. And uh, some people think that's good, uh, but I'm I'm with Ray that that is, but uh, the state of kind of sickness. Uh, and old age um but i don't know if i could find this paper i'm looking for um redox so oh whatever uh wallace maybe it's wallace Anyways, yeah, no, I think that's the, the state of stress, and I think you want to avoid that. <laughs> There's a quick video that Ray really, uh, that I put together not too long ago. It's called uh, Ketosis Ray Pete. Uh, this, this bioenergetic view of ketosis in two minutes. I think Ray, like, knocks it out of the park in this video, and he just really clearly... Uh, goes through the whole situation of ketosis and again i'm not denying anybody can't uh experience a health benefit on ketosis i every time i talk about this uh carnivore diet roddy patreon um this is specifically in regards to carnivore but i think the same is mostly true for ketogenic diets so I think removing hundreds of irritating additives, uh, removing grains, beans, starches, undercooked vegetables, uh, getting adequate protein, removing polyunsaturated fats, sometimes uh, removing unneeded supplements, which was like a big push on like the Charles Washington version of zero carb, and becoming proactive about a health situation can all improve things. And so, again, I just think in the long term, a person's going to feel some effects from doing that. Uh, speaking of... <laughs> Uh, not that this is the Paul Saladino show, because I frequently mention him. I'm interested in him because he's the face of carnivore. You know, he's very outspoken. He's a smart guy, you know, but this was uh, very telling, in my opinion. So this is from he wrote his book in February. And so he, he writes this bit and it's uh, is a ketogenic diet uh, harmful to the body. Does it raise cortisol? And he concludes with. Your thyroid and other hormones will be just fine on a ketogenic carnivore diet. <laughs> and then uh, I'd have to zoom in to see this. Um, he says, uh, yeah, so like I said, I've been eating. This is on Rob's Wolf, uh, Rob Wolf's podcast a few days ago. And he says, yeah, so like I said, I've been eating entirely animal based for two years now. Uh, that's really, I would say, carnivore diet exclusively for two years, dot, dot, dot. And he says, I was living in San Diego and I was feeling a little cold. San Diego is a little bit chilly, but I was like, I'm a young man. I'm muscular. I shouldn't be cold like this. <laughs> Same thing I experienced, by the way. Uh, dot, dot, dot. And he says, I'm just going to reintroduce carbohydrates and see if this helps with some of these, what I perceive to be mostly electrolyte and slightly thyroid related stuff without carbohydrates. So I, some people are going to immediately say, you know, you should respect Paul change in his mind and stuff. And I do. I love that. But, um, but again, there, why express such a high degree of certitude? That's the thing that is irritating. Like, I, any doctor should probably understand how complex the whole system is. And your thyroid and other hormones will be just fine on a ketogenic carnivore diet is um just a really stupid thing to say i don't think there's anything any other way around that you know so uh i'm sure he rushed through this book so maybe that was part of a factor uh being on the diet for only a, like probably a year or so when writing it uh but like how many people read that and were experiencing thyroid problems and then were like well you know he, he knows what he's talking about so uh yeah 
Uh, okay, what was the thoughts on T3 only therapy? We already talked about that. How is it logical to say that fat burning mimics a diabetic state? A diabetic state is inherently catabolic in which you eat your own tissues. While eating fat, uh, while eating fat and burning it is completely the opposite of diabetes. Uh, well, there, I think there can be like different rates of in intensity <laughs> of the fat metabolism. Um, so, so I guess the, the general idea here would be that, uh, uh, let me find this paper. This Wolf paper in 1983, and they say there seems to be little doubt that uh, there are increased in our signals for increased mobilization of fat in shock trauma and sepsis. And uh, shoot, I was just uh, looking for it. Oh, a Fran. Um, different Fran paper. Uh, the the non esterified free fatty acids or NEFA or free fatty acids uh, they are suppressed during high carbohydrate diets and increased in stress high concentra uh, e.g. high concentrations uh, concentrations of seventeen hundred uh, I don't know, is it micro moles were found in racing drivers before a race. So again, this is just the the. I don't think it's full blown diabetes. I think it's just the low carb keto stuff is mimicking a stress state. I think that's the idea. I don't really understand this person's quote. Or just a minute, can you guys see this? Okay, yeah, you can. I don't. Maybe I don't understand this person's question. <laughs> um, a diabetic state is in inherently catabolic in which you eat your own tissues. Uh. Okay, we'll just have to move on. Okay, so I ordered some SinoPlus and SinoMol. I know you have an article about thyroid supplementation. However, I find it hard to determine how to start out. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, you guys are amazing. Uh, we're already at an hour. Wow, that's insane. Um, let's make sure everything is okay. Georgie Dinkov, next week or the week after, then. Ray, Pete, the week after that. And I'm sure all you guys are super stoked that we're going to talk about Stalin again. <laughs> um, and. OK, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything in the chat. The lead singer of my old band is in the chat, <laughs> Mr. Grant Arno. <laughs> uh, OK, let me. Keep doing this. Uh, okay. Uh, so I ordered some SinoPlus and Sinomo. I know you have an article about the thyroid supplementation. However, I find it hard to determine how to start. How would you recommend to start with these two medicines? Can you may, uh, maybe describe the process of starting this and how to gradually increase and decrease? So just as somebody doesn't know, um, th this is the article I wrote. Um, I, it really is like a good aggregation of my thoughts on how to use thyroid and it's just like a lot of quotes from ray i think one of the most important quotes if i minimize this uh, a most important quotes is uh, from broda in 1976 he says the proper dosage of any individual is the minimum needed to relieve symptoms most commonly in adults this is two grains three grains sometimes are needed rarely four grains may be required the, uh, the basal temperature may be still a little low, but one is treating symptoms, not ne necessarily temperature per se. And so I think a good uh, starting place like Broda outlines in that book is uh, trying half a grain. And so with SinoPlus, I really do recommend getting a scale. And SinoPlus, is, uh, half a grain of that is 26 milligrams. And so that's about five micrograms of T3 and 20 micrograms of T4. And so I think that is uh, just an excellent starting place. And then to that, you could add two or five micrograms of, of T3 at a later time of day. And I think that is five milligrams on a scale. And that's for like 2.5 micrograms. And then five micrograms is, I think, tw uh, this man, am I screwing this up? I think 10 milligrams is 2.5 micrograms. And then 20, <laughs> 20 milligrams is five micrograms. 
So that's, I think that's a good starting place, me, me, uh, monitoring your temperature and pulse for two or three weeks. Marking it down on a calendar, you know, I'm pretty absent-minded. I, whenever I change my dose of thyroid, I always uh, mark it down on a calendar, and I tell myself that I, I won't change the dose until two or three weeks uh, goes up because thyroid ramps up, and then when you stop it, it, it ramps down. And so occasionally I'd, I'd stop. And I'd be like, oh, my, I feel great. Everything's fine. I don't need that dose of thyroid. And then two or three weeks, two or three weeks later, I would be hurting very badly. And so it was uh, it, in retrospect, it was not a good thing to lower that dose. But you don't find out till later in my experience. And so uh, hopefully uh, that answers it. And then again, just fortifying your diet with the nutritional nutritious things like liver and oysters and, and it's getting a source of magnesium uh eating salt to help retain the magnesium things like that are all important especially if a person's having trouble okay we'll go for about five ten more minutes and then i'll answer the super chats and then we'll get out of here we won't make this too overkill uh francisco says the role of shb shbg in libido people usually say they want to lower the SHBG, have more free tests and better libido, but on testosterone replacement form, there are plenty of people who seem to suffer from low libido and not responding to androgens because of low SHBG. I don't, I have papers about SHBG. I don't fully understand it. I know the low level is not good. Uh, I think Ray thought the function of SHBG was partly to bind, I think it, uh, can bind estrogen and he says it to keep it out of cells and so a high lo higher level is protective in the sense that it's binding up estrogen but also i think in liver disease shbg can go really high maybe that's in response to the liver not functioning and uh the higher estrogen that's known to be in, in cirrhosis so i i don't know i don't i i maybe it's too confusing to try to solve a problem based on shbg because of uh, all the variables involved uh but yeah what are your thoughts on berberine many experts say it works like antibiotic killing bad bacteria in the gut leaving good bacteria alone excuse me any thoughts on berberine would be appreciated i don't know anything about it <laughs> good question so i can't be more helpful uh danny maybe this one i'm in a full-blown uh aas cycle uh, that is just a uh, uh, steroid. Uh, and a <laughs> yeah, anabolic androgenic steroid. Okay. Uh, cycle with letrozole, and I lost my penal sensitivity and interest in sex. Can progesterone restore it? Thank you, Danny. You are one of my favorite, Georgie. I appreciate it. Um, for what it's worth, you know, I, I don't think it's, there's no specific order a person has to try things, but I think progesterone, I don't know if that's like the, just in, in my point of view, I don't know if that's like the best starting place, especially if, especially if there's like already libido problems, you know, maybe trying it, uh, if, if a person had an intense interest in it, uh, interest in it, maybe trying it and seeing what it did would be like, the effects might be very quick. You might know if it was helpful or not helpful quickly. But uh, in that situation, it sounds pretty serious and like a quality of life thing. And so maybe getting lab work for the TSH, prolactin, total cholesterol, the vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, and addressing the thyroid function if it's low, I think would be a starting place for something serious like that. And so um, I think for anything sexually related or libido related, I think thyroid and vitamin D are really excellent starting places. That's not to say progesterone wouldn't help. It just, uh, it could be a, a mixed bag. Troy, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even, uh, it's, uh, not that matters, but this subject, very taboo. Uh, I don't have any specific thoughts on it. I'm sure I've read the same stuff that uh, everybody else has read. And uh, I'd want to ask Ray about it again. I just don't, I don't even know if that's something you can talk about on YouTube anymore. So I'm sure that, uh, Again, I, I think this channel is too small to matter, but uh, yeah, might not want to tempt fate. But good question. I just I don't have anything. I can't speak intelligently about it at all. Uh, Young says, "Can you talk about Ray? Ray does not recommend iodine. What I've read is iodine is the most effective way to detox from halogens like bromide chloride." chloride. So the, uh, this is the selling point. You know, one of the selling points to increase, uh, also to increase thyroid. And so I. 
before I ever knew who Ray Pete was, I followed Dr. Brownstein and Fletchus, who were or Fleckus, were who were two iodine advocates, and I got their test. I uh, it was like a urine test and I think something else, and sent it to them and said I was iodine deficient. So I got their iodorol tablets, started with really low amounts, and they said if that wasn't working, to try higher amounts. And something I experienced many times was uh, and I like my vegan old memory is a little bit blurry in different situations but i remember consistently whenever i would take an iodorol tablet i would feel like so cold it, it would be like a hypothermia type of cold when i would take the iodorol and i thought it was from bromine chloride and fluoride, uh, fluoride uh, detox and so that's why i kept doing it but i think in retrospect after reading ray's information i was just experiencing uh severe thyroid suppression <laughs> um so, uh, so these are a bunch of different references from Ray sent these to somebody, but the, the interesting one to me was the wolf Chikos effect. And apparently the thyroid gland has a capacity to reduce thyroid hormone production in the presence of excess iodine by reducing the organification of the iodine. So this is like the thyroid su suppress suppressive nature of iodine there's apparently something that's known enough to give it a name. Uh, and they, another paper, they, these, resu these results suggest that excessive consumption of iodine in the United States may be responsible for increased incidence of autoimmune thyroiditis. So again, I don't have a crazy strong opinion on this, like as far as the physiology goes, because I, I, to be honest, I don't really understand it. But it, in terms of my own experience with diodorol, it makes a lot of sense to me that it... Uh, powerfully suppresses the, the thyroid because I don't think I've ever been that cold in my entire life. Okay. Uh, what's up, Danny? Uh, hey, A.D. Russ. Hey, Metridus Seps Sepsius. Uh, hey, everybody in the chat. Sincerely appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Give this episode a like. <laughs> Subscribe if you haven't already. Sincerely appreciate that. Georgie, either um, next week or the week after, and then Ray after that. And yeah. Okay. Uh, how many super chats do I have? Check this out. Oh, not many. We can get through those really quickly. Okay, let me go for some more questions. Uh, okay, we went over the iodine. Uh, sorry to hear about Georgie. Me too. Uh, yes, please. Something uh, around potassium being apparently, I read, being wasted by vitamin D being too high. Potassium I find not often mentioned by Ray, and it would be more of a take on it. I don't have a strong opinion about potassium, but Ray does mention it as being like a fill-in for insulin, helping you the cells use glucose uh, or sugar. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't know that much about it, but he does mention it. And also, I think a long time ago, Ray mentioned that he ate like a zucchini every day for the potassium. And so not something that people often talk about. But I, I think Ray is concerned about potassium. Um, but to be totally honest with you, I don't uh, in my like blurry picture of like cellular metabolism and physiology, I don't have like a strong understanding for uh, potassium, it, its specific role. Um, but yeah, but I know Ray, Ray does talk about, maybe we could chat with him about it, uh, next time. Osteoporosis and how to reverse it. Getting lab tests, you know, checking the prolactin. I know that's involved in, uh, osteoporosis, things like vitamin D, getting your calcium up, getting your thyroid function up, consuming enough copper. I think that's, um, I have a interesting paper. Um, here we go. The loss of pigmentation might uh, also be expected in chronic copper deficiency since the pronounced uh, feature in most species. Osteoporosis is another feature seen in all species that are copper deficient. The important reduction in the activity of cytochrome C oxidase um, and beef liver and shellfish are among the best sources. Uh. Okay. Uh, so, so very basic things: vitamin D, vitamin K, checking your thyroid function, and that can be checked by lab tests and measuring your pulse and temperature. 
And I think that might be, and aspirin, I think, has uh, osteo, uh, anti osteoporosis features as well. Um, let me just find it real fast. Aspirin, osteo. I think they called it like a new drug for osteoporosis. Oh, here it is. Aspirin can promote a trabecular bone remodeling, improving three-dimensional structure of trabecular bone, increased bone density of uh, cancellous in osteoporotic rat by stimulating bone formation. It may become a new drug for the treatment of osteoporosis. And Ray's written volumes, I think, about estrogen's role in osteoporosis. Um, okay. Linda says, is it possible to improve uh, th uh, thread veins in particular on my legs through diet and or supplements? I think progesterone is the thing that I've heard Ray mention, but I, to be honest, I don't know that much about it. Um, I don't have much experience with it. Uh, Linda, Lennon says, do you know anything about breathing? I've heard a lot of benefits of CO2 can be achieved by breathing property. A lot of people point to Bateco, but I'm uh, not sure. I think it's good to become aware of the breath uh, via the the like concentrating on your nose breathing. Um, but I don't think breathing slower is a way to mimic the effects of thyroid. And so, uh, yeah, I, again, I think becoming aware of the breath is important and is helpful. But I, I uh, uh, I, I don't think it can replace good thyroid function, and that increases the 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 breath and the the pulse rate. And so, um, I think Ray in one of his old articles said that he liked Buteka's work on CO two, but he wasn't impressed by his way to increase it. Um, and he says diet supplement center tips for starting an energy metabolism of seventy year old. <laughs> So at 35, I have a long way to go before I reach 70. So it'd be totally disingenuous for me giving tips to somebody. Uh, Ray would be a good person. You know, like I'm sure his metabolism, his body has changed as he's aged. And it'd be interesting to get his take on what he needed more of, needed less of uh, as he got older. Um, but I would have no perspective on it. David says, connective tissue disorder, was wondering about best foods, supplements, et cetera, to improve skin, collagen. Uh, it's, I don't know. I, I, I just haven't read anything specifically about this, so I couldn't uh, elucidate or, or share any valuable things. Um, yeah, other than just eating collagen. <laughs> and so I'm sure this person has already thought of that. Chat, do you have any ideas? Uh, Uh, doesn't look like it. Okay. Uh, Shafael says, Hey, Danny, I was wondering if you and Rob from Perfect Hair Health someday in the future do a podcast together since the main point of your guys' channel and hair and both of you talk about repeat principles except for a few different approaches mitigating hair loss, discussing different viewpoints and great, as Rob mentioned in his website. I think he's a nice guy. I think my thoughts are kind of summed up in that video I made about uh, uh, nitric oxide and male pattern, so-called male pattern baldness. And uh, does he have any content on YouTube? Because <laughs> the only other thing is, like, if he feels like he's really made some headway in, like, the physiology of baldness, like, I think it's important to share that information, you know? So, again, he, he's doing his own thing. Uh, and I don't necessarily find his work to be interesting or compelling. And so I think that would make for a, a bad conversation, but he seems like a nice guy. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about him. I just, the stuff I've seen of his work, I'm just, uh, it's very hard for me to uh, ha like have a hour live stream with, with somebody that I find to be like uninteresting or I'm not necessarily amped on what they have to say. And so it would just, it'd probably be a bad live stream. Uh, why did I go uh, so icy cold in my fingers on keto? I think it's, that can be from the high adrenaline, like rerouting the blood supply to the central organs and away from the peripheral, um, the hands, the feet, the nose, uh, sometimes the genitals. 
I recently saw a commercial for Simfort Shampoo. Does carbonic acid shampoo really cure baldness? Claims a deep, clean sebum from pores and stimulates blood flow. I've never heard of this before. Uh, car- uh, carbon dioxide uh, exits. <laughs> it combines with uh, water to form carbonic acid, and then carbonic acid, I might be getting this wrong, I think binds with uh it's helping to remove water and also calcium out of the cell. But I don't, I don't understand it enough to, again, to speak intelligently on what a topical uh, thing uh, application would be doing. Um, maybe, I don't know. James says, Danny, how has your work with Carl Rogers influenced your approach to mental health and physical well-being? So the one thing I've learned, I think, from talking to people is that it's much less about <laughs> like giving them technical information and a lot more about just having a conversation, I think, with somebody that might be able to just like have the same experience, like that ha- has had similar experiences as you have, because um, uh, I just I don't think I'm like the most technical person in the world. So that just like is that can't be why some people have found like conversing with me to be useful. But I have had like lots of different experiences and things. and so. Um, I, I really identify with the Rogers idea of if somebody, somebody can talk about their own experience, that's like therapeutic in and of itself. And so it's sometimes just answering, asking the right questions can help bring that about. And I'm fortunate to have this just like wacky health history that I think sometimes I can reach in the barrel of my own experience and then ask a question that's relevant to what the person is talking about. And so. Um, the other thing I really like about Carl's uh, approach was, um, I think in uh, on becoming a person towards the end, he talked about like his patients uh, being less afraid of, and we're having like a rigid attitude towards needing to know the outcome of like any situation, and then during the client centered therapy, they became much more fluid. And I, I really identify with that because for a long time, I didn't even travel because I was like, well, I don't know where the grocery store is. I don't know what kind of food is going to be available there. And uh, so therefore, I should not go. And I know traveling is kind of like a, a meme. <laughs> and I think traveling, people's traveling days are legitimately <laughs> almost over, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think... Uh, kind of breaking through those barriers uh, to raise toolbox of things to help correct my many metabolic problems, lower the serotonin and things like that. I think it's helped me be okay with not knowing outcomes of different situations and also knowing that uh, things will be okay, whatever, wherever I, I land, you know, and I'll make it work. And so I had no idea what necessarily to expect when I got to uh, Thailand. But you just like there's a company called Paleo Robbie that sends out beef liver. You know, I didn't know that. If I figured it out, I order beef liver through Paleo Robbie, and if that didn't work, I would have found it somewhere else. You know, and so it's just making it work and um, for the things that you think matter. You know, so again, I'm not an expert on Rogers's work, but I think he had a lot of good insights. Uh, great question. Uh, which diet lifestyle would you say is the most healthy and the most sustainable for longevity and overall energy? Uh, <laughs> I, I, again, I think it's about increasing the pulse rate and temperature. There are many different ways to do it. And if a person is in, in maybe past some age, I don't know what that specific age is, maybe, I don't know, 20, 25, 30, and they're experiencing some kind of degenerative health problem, maybe they should in addition to diet, investigate thyroid, investigate aspirin and other things like that to help mitigate the, the kind of self uh, propelling damage, the cycle of inflammation and stress and things like that, that is very hard to turn off. And so, um, so again, I don't think it's necessarily about the diet or lifestyle per se. I think it's just finding ways that the person is comfortable with of trying to increase the pulse and temperature. And it turns out that everybody feels a different way about different therapies. <laughs> uh, I remember you briefly mentioning how you separate aspirin from its bulking agents. I was hoping that you could elaborate on this again for me, please. 
very simple. So I'll usually uh, take like a Pyrex glass. I'll heat some water. I'll drop, drop in the aspirin tablets, uh, maybe some baking soda, and that makes them dissolve faster. And after a few minutes, it will be all the junk will be at the bottom, and then it'll just be left with this liquid. And I swirl that around a little bit, and the junk will concentrate in the middle. Then I'll pour it, I'll pour it into another glass, and then mix that with Coke or juice or whatever, and, and take that usually after a meal. But I've tried multi-gram doses of aspirin many times and never had a single stomach problem when using it uh, that way. Uh, uh, can you talk about oral health and how we can avoid x-rays for diagnosis? Uh, the only way I always avoid x-rays when I went to the dentist was when I was in Mexico and the woman was like, do you want x-rays? And I was like, no. She's like, okay. <laughs> and in... Uh, the U.S., I actually have a friend who's a dentist, and I said, hey, can I avoid x-rays? And he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> so I think it might be like a legality thing. Let's make sure chat is okay. Uh, Mike says, just tuning in, what happened to Georgie? Georgie couldn't make it today, uh, but hopefully he'll be the next, next week or the week after. I think I'm almost done with these questions. Uh, how much water should you drink to not increase prolactin too much? I don't know. This probably is individual, so it probably depends how low the thyroid function is. Uh, but I think if you're drinking milk and orange juice and coffee, and uh, I think that could cover a person's water requirement. Tell me, uh, <laughs> what would be bad about taking a replacement dose of 25 micrograms of T3 while on carnivore diet? If low T3 is the only real worry on blood work, why not just use it? So uh, back to the beginning of this, we're talking about the, the NADH, the redox, the pyruvate to lactate, the ketone body ratio, the beta hydroxybutyrate to acetoacetate, um, the inhibition of pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, the inhibition of cytochrome C oxidase. These are all, I think, I'm like just scratching the surface of like kind of the bad aspect of the the fat metabolism. And so there are many, many, many bad things that happen or or things that you do not want to carry out in a prolonged way, I think. And so again, in the fat the fat uh, liberation of fatty acids is going to coincide with lipid peroxidation as well as the generation of prostaglandins. Uh, to say that T3 is the only real worry is um, not accurate. Uh, Danny, how do you work your way around PUFA? Is it one of those pick your battles types of things where you do on a date or restaurant and stock up on vitamin E and aspirin before indulging? I believe everything here tries to be best to avoid PUFA as much as possible, but it's hard to avoid it completely. So we kind of covered this a little bit. Um, so the thing I didn't mention before is I cook 99.9% .9 of my own food. So to me, that's not like, <laughs> that's just like something. I, I do every day. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying that's a habit I've gotten into. So whenever I'm hungry or I want food, I'll go to the grocery store, get a lot of food. And, and sometimes this, this was a problem in Mexico for me because I lived actually kind of far away from the grocery store. And so every day or two, I, when I'd run out of food, I'd have to go to the grocery store. And that I, it would take me so long to get to the grocery store and go back home that it, like several hours would have passed and I'd, I'd be like way behind on my food intake. And so, so living next to a grocery store is for me kind of essential, you know, and when I go back to Mexico, that's something I'm actually going to be, uh, I know myself and my life will be a lot easier if I'm closer to a grocery store. And so that's how important cooking to me is. And so I don't know where in other people's lives, how central of an event that is, but it's some, something I prioritize. and. Not only do I feel like I'm kind of getting ripped off if I eat out, but again, it's, I feel like I'm getting really bad food quality in general. And so if there were some like amazing dish that I uh, loved eating out, I'd try to make it at home, if that makes any sense. And, the, and invariably, a person can probably construct a better version of that dish that they really liked. Um, but I guess I'm just like kind of limiting PUFA by kind of almost by accident by just cooking all my food. It's just like... If you go to my Instagram, Instagram.com slash the Danny Roddy web blog, just the foods I eat are not very high in polyunsaturated fat, just in general. 
And when those rare occasions, when I do go to a restaurant or something, I will usually carry an aspirin in my pocket or something. Uh, what do you think of soaking liver in milk for one to two hours prior to cooking it? Apparently it removes the strong taste of liver and the iron liver being displaced by the calcium. I don't know if the iron is being displaced. I've never tried the soaking. Uh, but Kyle Mamunis, my buddy, he made a video about how important it was to take the liver and then press it against like paper towels for 10, 20 minutes. And that that can, that really works. Like it significantly reduces the like the acrid taste of liver. And then the other thing that I think is uh, important is um, getting good liver. <laughs> and so sometimes in San Francisco, I went to a place called Belcampo and apparently they have good meat, but they sold me the worst liver I've ever eaten in my entire life. And I took like one bite of it. And I think I like almost like threw it up. It was so disgusting. And so there is good liver and bad liver. And I think the good liver is less acrid, disgusting tasting than really bad liver. That's been hanging out for a long time. Um, I think this question has been asked, but I, st I still don't know anything about Ehlers, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Um, please, I've discovered that I'm autistic now. I'm 37 years old. I'd like to know what our race opinions on cause of autism. So he has a newsletter on autism. I think it's very complicated. And he just talked to David uh, Zento about uh, serotonin and autism. Could you explain any of the consequences and how I can minimize them? I realize that depending on foods I eat, can minimize this, the symptoms. Do you have any tips such as foods to avoid, supplements to take, just to give me a direction on what to do? Are very knowledgeable. So I just don't. I don't have any direct experience with autism per se but i think we are living in like an autistic society <laughs> and like probably the lower thyroid person probably tends towards those symptoms associated with autism so everybody you meet is probably on some spectrum you know um so uh i, I checking the thyroid function uh everything that reduces serotonin is the only thing that um so if i minimize this Type in autism, third time. Spell autism right. Uh, two of the most consistently observed biological findings in autism are increased serotonin levels in the blood and immunological abnormalities, including audio reactivity with tissues of central nervous system. Uh, hyperserotonemia in autism, and then SSRIs might be increasing the rate of autism. So I, I, again, because I don't have any direct experience with this, I, I just say increasing the pulse and temperature, checking the thyroid function, eating good nutrition, complete nutrition, and then solving any bowel problems. And I, and I imagine that would be especially important for limiting serotonin because most of the Serotonin in the body is produced in the bowel, according to Constance R. Martin. Serotonin. Approximately 90% of the total serotonin is found outside the central nervous system. The blood platelets and gastrointestinal tract account for around 95%, and serotonin is a component of central per peripheral mast cells. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll, Raphael, I'll try to get a hold of Ray's uh, write to Ray Pete's newsletter at Gmail and ask him or uh, if you can get a hold of his uh, newsletter on autism. Harry, uh, thank you, Harry. He says, "Have you read Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Fritzenberg? I was hoping you could discuss it. Uh, the implications after reading that cross current perils of electro pollution by Robert, uh, Robert Becker." And biological effect of millimeter radio waves research uh, article in 1977, to name a few. I feel like our community as a whole is downplayed as the EMF impact. I don't, uh, I don't mean you specifically. I remember you discussing your EMF meter. The evidence uh, seems to stress that acronym EMF should be thrown around just as much as PUFA. <laughs> Trust me, I'm worried. <laughs> we mentioned it at the beginning of the show. Um, there's just no way this amount of... Uh, Wi-Fi and cell phones, it's like hundreds of thousands of times higher than the safe amount. There's like a report called the Bio Initiative Report. I think I have it in my notes somewhere. And and again, they talk about like the safe levels and we're experiencing like so, so much higher than them. So 
Yeah, yeah, man. I think it's um, again. I, I think the increase in the intracellular calcium, the nitric oxide, all the bad effects that nitric oxide has, the blocking of the cytochrome C oxidase, the I think it activates like cortico release hormone, which kicks off the stress response. I think it uh, promote uh, obviously the liberation of fatty acids and promotes like lipid peroxidation, things like that. So uh, I think it's one of the elements in our environment, the, the reducing elements, uh, blocking the respiratory chain and jamming the electrons in the cell and uh, very concerned about it. You know, I, I shielded my office in and grounded it in Mexico, but that, wasn't that I, I learned a lot of things doing that, but I, I wouldn't do it again. And uh, when in Mexico, I'll probably be uh, a shop for some kind of tent or something uh, that's mobile, you know, in case I don't stay in the place for too long. Um, I have, those are great uh, papers and books. I'll, I'll have to check them out. Uh, the only thing I can, I can say is, you know, I, I and I, this does, this is just a take this with a grain of salt. I did bring up the EMF stuff to Ray. And he immediately rerouted the conversation back to PUFA. And so I, I have no doubt that the EMF are in, inherently harmful in some way, but maybe they're especially harmful when a person is super saturated with the polyunsaturated fats. Uh, thank you for that, Harry. Very good question. Josh says, thoughts on the photo, a photic sneeze reflex. <laughs> it's almost as if I'm allergic to the sun when I first see it. It doesn't happen when I wear my blue blocking sunglasses. Um, yeah, I don't have any specific thoughts about that. Uh, I've experienced that before. Uh, I'm, I couldn't uh, add anything to that. Uh, thanks for that question, though, Josh. Uh, okay, 125. I think we're almost done here. How are you guys? Thank you for joining me. Georgie, next week or the week after, and then on the, tw I think it's the, 20 the 27th or 28th, Ray will be joining us again oh harry there you are thank you so much harry appreciate that <laughs> john flaherty <laughs> autism is unstoppable gene lennon uh heather kardochev metrodis mike uh thank you guys so much for joining me uh liam i appreciate it guys chris danny ad ross uh zuckberg <laughs> chris gregory uh drummer boy harry Rachel, uh, and, and other people. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Get through these and then do the soup chats and then get out of here. Uh, I'd be interested, uh, if you have thoughts on low libido and athletes and maybe some ideas to remedy this issue. If, uh, if it was just a stress of exercise, obviously just stopping the exercise for a while and relaxing. If, if that, I don't know if that would have any positive effect. If it wasn't that, uh, assessing the calcium amount because the calcium uh, influences prolactin and I think high, high prolactin is not controversial and, and associated with different uh, libido problems. In fact, sometimes a person can have a normal testosterone and, and still not uh, kind of produce a satisfactory libido and I think that's because of the high prolactin. I have a few papers about it. Um, so something easy like calcium didn't work. Maybe Checking the, the digestion, so if there's constipation or uh, diarrhea or gas or things, I think the, uh, the intestine can be this large monkey wrench into the production of androgens and, and things like that. So calcium, uh, checking the pulse and temperature, kind of the, the broken record uh, that I am about these things, the checking the pulse and temperature, making sure you're getting full nutrition and then, um, excuse me, like solving diarrhea constipation or gas those would be the most basic things if stopping the exercise and just resting didn't solve the problem what has been your experience with vitamins e and k how do you know when you need more of them uh vitamin e i don't have that much experience with other than the small amount in progest e k uh i for a long time i just took it as insurance but actually when i was in we were in the other uh, place in thailand peach it um i was taking aspirin and I cut my toe really badly on around the pool because they just had like this exposed board. And I thought I was taking enough vitamin K, but it turns out that I wasn't because <laughs> I bled a lot and the blood looked a little bit too thin. And so, um, I mean, I didn't cut myself again, but I started taking more vitamin K specifically after that. And so I was maybe getting about one to two milligrams per day. And so 
I, I try to get three or four now uh, via a topical administration. Um, and other than that, it it would uh, vitamin K might just improve being very vague here, but improve the overall quality of life. You know, I think things are generally better, better mood and things like that when I'm taking it. But uh, with K is I feel like I can pinpoint more of the effects from vitamin D than K, but it's hard for me to specifically speak on that. But uh, uh, it seems like a superstar vitamin of all the positive things that it does. Oh, teeth, oh, teeth stuff too. I think it makes your teeth a little bit slicker. Craig says, love the shows. Danny, do you have any insights on how Tourette's is triggered or what causes it? I don't, I know literally nothing about Tourette's, so I can speak about it. Thank you for that though, Craig. Uh, DBO514, he says, uh, can you talk a little bit about why certain antihistamines have such great benefits for hair regrowth and their relation to the hair cycles? You have wrote, uh, you wrote a great article about it a few years back. It'd be nice to see you revisit the points you made uh, since then. I'd have to like read that article to get up to speed on it. Um, but I think it has to do with those mast cells. Uh, and I, and it, at some point I think the mast cells become like a less of a constructive side of the organism and more of like a pathological side of the organism. Because again, just to get context on what mast cells do, I emailed Ray in like 2014 and I was like, what is the function of mast cells? And he thought they were like guiding the differentiation of stem cells. And so that clearly implicates them in, in some major way for air, uh, air growth. And the fact that those few papers talked about the balding area being infiltrated and activated uh, mast cells, uh, I think that's, it's like the evidence at the scene of the crime, you know? Um, and so, and then mast cells uh, re releasing their histamine and that having a de-energizing effect in some way. And so um, I think the article that I had wrote says that the, the histamine fluctuates in the hair cycle and that it's highest, I think, in the beginning antigen glycolytic phase, and then it decreases over time. And maybe it rises again during catagen or, or something like that. So I, I, I would honestly have to go back and read that article. I, and to answer your question, I've learned pretty much nothing new about it since then, <laughs> which is very, very sad. <laughs> Uh, DGM369 says, isn't it bad having a uh, calcified uh, pineal gland and does not produce melatonin from serotonin in the brain? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about this one. I couldn't speak uh, to it. To stumble upon this study, maybe women having bad sense of direction uh, does it have to do with incidents of pineal uh, calcification. I found a study that showed uh, calcification in women and birds. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Good question. I don't know. Uh, Tone says, how do you learn branding and content creation? Uh, I honestly don't know. I did part of the, I'm not, a, the, in my band, I was the bass player, but I'm not, I'm not like a born musician. And part of a lot of the fun that I had in the band was making flyers and creating our website. And so I'd make something and then um, the singer is still one of my best friends, you know, and I would send him the flyer and he'd be like, oh, I don't like this and I don't like that. And he'd send it back to me. And I'd be like, oh, and, uh, and he, I sent it to him again. He'd be like, oh, I don't like this. And I like, don't like that. And so we had like kind of this uh, um, creative relationship in addition to the music we were making of making websites and um flyers and stuff and i never took any courses in photoshop or whatever it was just kind of like i needed to learn how to use them to create the flyers for the band that i was in that we were we were passing out the flyers and so i think with the band there was like a, a very uh i don't know what the right word is we were all on the same page about our our brand of like what we wanted to be and we knew that bands that were big knew who they wanted to be and they knew who they were. And if you didn't do that, the label would tell you who you were, which was really bad. And so we, we tried as much as we could to talk about these types of things, even though a lot of those conversations uh, didn't really work out. There were like, <laughs> we had the weirdest uh, mixing of personalities in, in the band. It was very difficult. But um, yeah, you know, just uh, like on our uh, speaker cabinets and stuff, we try to put graphics on there. So when we played, we had like a sense of design and things like that. And so learning that, was, I was like, yeah, it's good to 
for a person to like walk in the the venue and to see your speaker cabinet and to see a design on there and be like, oh, that's my band was called Dakota and be like, oh, that's Dakota's bass cabinet. You know, like I just thought that made a lot of sense. And then um, maybe like as much as I don't I don't like like them as a company or anything, but Apple. I probably made an impression on me too. Like everything Apple does, at least in like the Steve Jobs era, you kind of know that that is the brand, you know? So I think that probably made an impression on me as well. And then uh, when I was working with Chris Kresser, like doing his podcasts and things like that, um, <laughs> and then seeing like Rob Wolf's website and stuff, I'm not trying to be mean, but I thought their design language was like really ugly. And I think a lot of people's like websites are, um, they're designed to like get an email or, or something like that. And I think this is so stupid, but I was like, oh, their websites are so ugly. I think like part of the reason I think I wanted to like <laughs> d- uh, make a, we- a health website was just to make something that was like more uh, beautiful or something like that. And so the whole design aspect, I get I get a big kick out of. And I think it's part of the fun uh, of all of this. And so uh, but I don't <laughs> I don't have some like a uh, specific goal it's just it's kind of like a fun thing to do and i'm always changing things as well um okay that's a great question though um so again i just i just think my life experiences and i, I think i gravitate to cohesive co- cohesive things maybe that speaks about me and wanting uh things that make a holistic amount of sense or something Cardo Chev, uh, has, have you listened to Alex Jones interview Rogan talking about technology being communicated to Nazis via demons in the spiritual dimension? I think it would be uh, interesting to get Ray's perspective on this idea or the idea of remote viewing. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Cardo Chev. Um, well, remote viewing, I don't know if Michael Persinger directly did things with that, but I know the CIA has done like lots of investigation on remote viewing. And I didn't hear that, Alex Jones. Uh, was that his interview with... Um, the one that like got blocked on YouTube. I don't, I don't remember that one to be honest, but uh, I did, I did ask Ray uh, in a conversation on the phone that I just intended to get him on the phone to ask him questions about hair loss. And it inevitably drifted into kind of the power elite stuff. And I did ask him, I was like, how much of like Satanism and like kind of occult stuff is involved with the, the power elite and, and not and, and stuff. And he said, oh, he thought the Nazis and Hitler were into that stuff. But he said he thought it was window dressing. Um, uh, I did ask him also, it's on the wiki about uh, reincarnation. And I don't know if it's relevant, but he, he that like structure leaving no no the energy leaving a residue of structure applies to uh, in, according to ray after you're dead as well and so i think you leave something behind maybe in the ether or something like that and he was saying that uh maybe i should just read it instead of like butchering it um ray p wiki email maybe this is a good time to bring up wait ray p wiki.com I, I think I talked about this last time. This is just a notion note, but um, just for posterity, I put all of our the Ray interviews here. And if you click on these little arrows, it gives you like timestamps of all the topics covered. And then also uh, somebody mentioned this. And I thought it was a good idea. And I, 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 I don't know if you guys care, but uh, Ray Pete on nutrition in his own words. <laughs> and so I think Ray just gets misquoted all the times, you know, so I just went through a few of his articles and pulled out the exact quotes about nutrition. So, and then you can link back to the article to read the full context of what he's talking about. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if that will be helpful for anybody. And then there's an index of commonly used terms and definitions. And uh, just some quotes about a bioenergetic view as well. So enjoy that. Uh, RayPeteWiki.com. Here's the email exchanges. Uh, I won't read this whole thing, but if, if you guys are interested, you can check it out on the email wiki. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Carter Chubb. I, do, I don't know anything else about what you would ask. It's, it's very interesting to me. You know, I just I couldn't speak intelligently about it. Um, 
yeah, I should ask him about remote remote viewing, but I, I get, and I think Persinger kind of added some clarity to this, like the, everybody being in the 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 electrical field of the Earth somehow makes it so that we're all technically connected. And I think that that was the idea in his famous talk on YouTube. Okay, only two more. Uh, what makes people get up to urinate during the night when they should be sleeping, and how can this be remedied? I have tried everything from salt, uh, magnesium, gel uh, sugar, gelatin, water fasting, eight hours, <laughs> quitting caffeine. Nothing seems to help. In my limited experience, this is either, either the thyroid dose uh, or vitamin D. And the, uh, one time I was taking thyroid and it, it happened again and make, taking more vitamin D made it go away. And one time I thought I was taking enough vitamin D, but and then increasing the thyroid uh, made it go away. And so I, I suspect the common through line is just the vitamin D and the, the thyroid's effect on the liver able to uh, its ability to store sugar. And so that might change depending on the uh, amount of stress a person is under. Uh, uh, Danny, I'd like to hear more about you and how has your health improved lately? If it has, how have it uh, improved since you started peeing? <laughs> so I think health is a, a thing that is, is con constantly fluctuating, you know, like, um, like, I don't think I can think as clearly here being in kind of this condo. Uh, I, I have like a low level vertigo in being in these buildings. It's like hard, I've never really experienced it before. And then being in Thailand, I, for the first time, in my entire life developed like a low level cough, uh, just like a, a dry cough. And so that's uh, worrying. And I would suspect it's from the pollution. Um, like it's not, I don't have it now and I haven't had it for the last few days, but it will sometimes like rise up, uh, it will like come about. And so that's uh, obviously worrying to me, but I honestly think it's from the pollution because the pollution is so awful here. And I don't think even a PM P100 mask can protect you from the amount of pollution and the carbon monoxide. So being here is probably <laughs> pro has pro aging effects, you know. Um, but there are some good things about being here as well. So yeah, I think it's a uh, constant upkeep. You know, like I used to wonder why Ray was con changing things, but I think that's because the environment is is chronically changing and i i've said this before but it's like uh, i used to think that health, healthy was something you just like got to and then you stayed there but i think it's actually much more difficult than that and i think it's like something that's always changing and you have to keep up with it so um and also like the food quality is part of the curveball because uh you <laughs> get some brand of juice that seemingly has no additives in it and then it upsets your stomach or something and and they're not required to put what else is in the juice. And so that's a, just another unfortunate part about uh, the food supply. But yeah, constantly changing, uh, trying to stay flexible and learning new things, you know, uh, and chronically learning about uh, learning things about myself. I think that's the name of the game. OK, let's get to those super chats. Thank you guys so much. Uh, hit the like button if you guys are enjoying this episode. <laughs> that helps me. I appreciate it. Uh, let's get to these. Okay. Linda Bell for th $5. Thank you so much, Linda. Sincerely appreciate that. John says, uh, what is your opinion on A1 milk versus A2 milk issues? Is A1 milk uh, problematic? I don't know about this, but uh, I did have an article. Uh, like, I've heard that a lot. And then my buddy Cliff McCrary, who... I don't think he's really on the internet anymore. Uh, he had some like good uh, ar uh, articles saying that it was a scam, basically. So this tr Trustwell uh, A2 milk case, a critical review in uh, 2005. If a person is interested, they should check this out. Um, I forget the exact arguments, to be honest. Like I, I haven't read this paper in a while. But uh, they were saying this was a little bit of a marketing trick to charge more for like a, a similar thing. And so I, uh, given how uh, kind of the marketing world, I wouldn't be surprised uh, how duplicit is, it is. Uh, but I, there was a really expensive, like ultra pasteurized brand of A2 milk in, in San Francisco. I would sometimes get it. But um, and like there were a few times that I had digestive problems with milk, even after taking the antibiotic and just drinking A2 milk didn't solve it. So 
Um, I, I honestly think if I can get over my milk allergy, anybody can. I think it's more of a physiological problem than finding the right milk per se. Um, because now I, I really don't react to any types of milk. But, but, I, but I used to react to everything. Uh, okay, where's that window? Okay, um, what is your opinion, uh, anyone? Yeah, so I, I guess my general feeling is that it's not, uh, not super important. Uh, thank you for that, John. Uh, Gregory for ten dollars. He says, uh, any difference between vitamin D three supplement and sun since uh, qu quarantine? I'm meaning exorbitant amounts. Why does YouTube cut these questions off? Uh, I've been getting exorbitant amounts of sun, and now I could eat blocks of cheese, drink pints of milk without breaking out. Um. Yeah, no, I think there is a difference for sure. Like your, the light is having a positive biological effect in addition to increasing the vitamin D level, like the anti-inflammatory effect. So, and that's not surprising. Like, I don't think the idea is like supplement vitamin D and, and you never get need to get any light like that. I think ideally you want both, you know? Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure, but that that's interesting anecdote for sure. Uh, Ellie Z, my buddy, $5. Thank you, Ellie. He says twitching. What could be causing it? Muscle twitches. Um, so I think that goes back to, uh, let me make sure you guys can see this. The St. Georgie quote. Oh no. Let me just go ahead and find this. <laughs> Here it is. Um, St. Georgie, 1972, he says, The role of ATP is not limited to the contraction cycle. It dominates the physical state of muscle, even at rest, keeping it soft and pliable, keeping the actomycin dissociated. I have shown with uh, Bor uh, Borbia, uh, Borbiro <laughs> that rigor mortis is but a lack of ATP. And so, um, yeah, I've experienced that, like, pulsating eye, pulsating leg muscles, and when I was on zero carb... I used to wake up with the worst Charlie horses that felt like somebody was like stabbing me in a leg in the leg. And uh, because I don't meticulously monitor my magnesium intake or my salt intake, I do. I am pretty I do try to get a certain amount of calcium every day, but I think it is mostly related to my um, thyroid dose because I can't even remember the last time I had like a serious cr cramp or eye pulsing or anything like that. But but I think I did experience those symptoms when I dropped my thyroid too low a few times. So, um, according to Ray, uh, and I think Kyle Lomunis has some good work on this, the, the carbon dioxide is regulating the balance of potassium, calcium, sodium, and magnesium. And so that would make a lot more sense. And, uh, and then just the energy in general, um, maintaining the soft, pliable muscle and not the rigor mortis-like twitching. I think that's the idea. Um, but great question. Ellie, thank you for that. Harry Burgos, thank you so much, sir. Uh, appreciate it. So many chronic supporters of the show. Ellie, Harry, Cardo Chav, uh, Gregory, like uh, Helena, um, Linda, John. Thank you guys. Sincerely appreciate it. Uh, Harry for just $10. Nothing there. Cardo Chav, $4.99. Thank you so much. Gregory, $5. Uh, how dangerous is PUFA in real food when accompanied by vitamin E? Sometimes I crave a tablespoon of, or two of peanut butter. Um, so again, I, 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 I <laughs> this really it's I, I don't know if this is an academic thing or depending on the person's quality of the history of their quality of life or something like that. But if you get into like kind of what Ray is talking about, um, uh, this like four grams number. And so this, uh, I think this was on the Ray Pete forum somewhere. Somebody did have a productive conversation with him of talking about where four grams per day had come from. And Ray thinks this is, uh, the, the, he actually thinks it's lower, but four grams is like a good average. He thinks, I think to, is to resist cancer and other degenerative problems. And so this person is pressing him. Can you guys see this? Okay. This person is pressing him on it. And he actually says he thinks two grams would be even better. So 
again, it, I think it depends how convinced of kind of the PUFA accumulation theory of accelerated aging a person is. This fascinates me, you know, and again, my, you know, my I talked about my history of serious problems, you know, and, and so keeping this number as low as possible throughout my lifetime is attractive to me. But if somebody just could not uh, get on with normal life w without peanut butter or something like I would not tell them not to do it. You know, you got to make the sacrifices and things like that. So um, what, something I learned when I was vegan was like I couldn't just stop eating a food I liked. I had to replace it with something that I thought was like superior. And so uh, so again, maybe like the craving for the peanut butter or something, if a like maybe that points to some nutritional deficit, you know, that like maybe eating more or mixing up the fat, protein and carbohydrate could uh, increase the satiation, you know, because I, I feel like for what it's worth, I have like a much different relationship with food now. I used to like look forward to every meal and be so stoked about eating and like think about it all the time. And that is uh, the totally opposite, <laughs> like how I feel now. I like eating. I like eating delicious food and things like that, but I'm not anticipating every single meal like I used to and like uh, very obsessed with it. Uh, and so I think there's probably multiple reasons for that, but uh, it's like a very different relationship with food. Um, but I, I don't I don't know how specifically dangerous it, it would be with vitamin E. There was one paper that talked about at a certain threshold or something, the vitamin E wouldn't be that protective against the the PUFA, I think. And then Helena, the last one for ten dollars uh, Australian, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Helena. She says I've been taking Sinoplast since February two thousand twenty, from one six to a whole tablet over that time. Ran out on Sunday, and today notice my throat has a little hollow where previously it was fleshy. Why is this? I uh, I don't I don't know. I've never heard that before. Um, my throat has a little hollow where previously it was fleshy. I'm not sure about that. If Helena, if you want to send me an email with more information, I'd be happy to give you my two cents, but I, do, I don't have any, that is not ringing any specific bells uh, of why that is. Do you mean like your horse like throat or, or something like that? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much. I think we'll call it there. Went about two hours. Um, unless you guys have any questions uh, immediately in the chat. Um, let me give that a second. While you're here, give this episode a like. Um, next week, Georgie Dinkov, hopefully, or the week after, or not at all. I really don't know his schedule because he's traveling. And then the week, the last week of this month, uh, I'll be doing Ray either with Georgie or by myself. I so we'll uh, get into that. And um, what else? I did an interview with the Strong Sisters. It was very fun. And so I, I don't know when they're going to release that. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, waiting for questions doesn't look like it. Uh, thank you guys so much. Sincerely appreciate. It. Oh, the one other thing: the Spotify <laughs> Anchor.fm. This is now available as a podcast. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. So Anchor.fm and search Danny Roddy in Spotify. Thank you guys so much. I have an amazing audience. I'm very fortunate to be able to do what I'm able to do and to be supported by very intelligent. Uh, people um eric says what do you use for cooking for the pan um <laughs> let me just jump into this real fast um if you go to instagram no yeah dot com slash the danny roddy weblog uh, uh i use visions pants uh i think they're i like them a lot you know they i've never really noticed sticking until somebody mentioned it recently you kind of have to use a lot of oil with them uh, but I got this small little one to travel with and I really like it, but I've owned many visions pants over a period of a few years. Follow me on, uh, the Danny Roddy weblog. I put food stuff on there. I post a lot of content on Twitter that, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning that I don't post other places. So if you're really into this, you might like that. Uh, and then I also have a telegram T dot me slash Danny Roddy, which is like a mimic of the, um, a mimic of the Instagram if you're more into Telegram. And I think that is it. Scanning the chat one more time for questions. Okay. That looks good. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you guys either next week, the week after, but definitely the last week of this month. Thank you so much. 
Have a safe weekend. I'll talk to you guys soon. Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. Let us turn to the very strengths in technology that spawned our great industrial base and that have given us the quality of life we enjoy today. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies? I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished by Technologies, the high-flying hardware computer company which took a nosedive this year, may be bought out by the British firm Applied Computer Technologies. Piloting the space shuttle is very difficult to do, one would think. Can a, a, a kid or a normal person actually pull this off? Well, what I did when I designed this was I, I understood that problem. Uh, it seems the sweep of technology has no limits. San Francisco this week, the world's first robot bartender was unveiled. The robot can talk and take spoken orders and can mix 200 different drinks. But on the first test run, the robot knocked the glass off the bar and onto the floor and poured beer all over the counter. The robot's designer says there were still some bugs to be worked out.
Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. Let us turn to the very strengths in technology that spawned our great industrial base and that have given us the quality of life we enjoy today. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached